You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, J.T. Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Robert Dagoni back on the show with me. It's been a few years since he's been on the show, but he has an extraordinary new book. It's called The World Played Chess. It's available everywhere now. Uh, We'll put links in the show notes of this episode where you can go grab it or go visit your local bookstore. It's available everywhere. Robert Dagoni is one of those authors that I'm sure you have uh, at least one or two of his books on your shelf if you're an avid reader. And uh, this book is a must have. Uh, Welcome back to the show, Robert. Thanks very much. Thanks for the kind introduction. Absolutely. Um, Robert, we normally begin each show uh, by asking people what their first what what their first memory uh, is about wanting to be a writer or storyteller. And if I remember right, you told us this great story of um, I think you were in the seventh grade and uh, you gave a speech and the the teacher just, you know, kind of uh, took you to another classroom, if I remember right, and made you. Uh, do the speech over again. And up until that point, you had kind of been um, uh, a a student that that got in trouble a lot and, you know, maybe, you know, was easily distracted and that sort of thing. Um, But you told us this great story of of how um, someone recognizing that gift in you kind of changed the trajectory of your life. Um, do, Do you ever think back on that? And just just imagine what life could have been. Oh, all the time, all the time. Um, you know, I and you have a great memory. <laughs> I have to give you some credit, man. Um, no, all all the time. My uh, my mom was really the the inspiration for me to to want to write. You know, um, I was. You know, you were very kind in how you described me, but yeah, you know, I was pretty much a a, a punk and. Um, <laughs> It was, you know, my mom was handing me all these really great books at a young age. I didn't know what I was reading. I just knew that I loved the stories. You know, I was reading The Count of Monte Cristo and The Old Man and the Sea and The Great Gatsby and, um, you know, Of Mice and Men and Lord of the Flies. And, you know, just she was uh, she was an English teacher for a brief period of time before she started having 10 kids. And, um, you know, she just she had all these books and and so she would just give them to me and she'd say, oh, this is a great story. Have you read this? And that really was that really did just kind of get me going. And um, you yeah, have an active imagination. Um, I'm different than my brothers and sisters. Um, they all went into medicine, um, doctors and, and pharmacists and, you know, dentists and things like that. And that just really wasn't my path. And I, I knew that at a very young age, you know, my path was more in storytelling. Did um, you know, as as you kind of found your place and 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 found uh, your publishing path, um, you know, you, I think all of us are familiar with your Tracy Crosswhite series, um, and and you know, finding this character that has uh, probably come to mean a lot to you. Um, do do you? Do you find yourself getting invested in in these characters and these worlds that you build and and the um, do do you start finding yourself kind of crossing uh, over with your characters and and with the storylines that you create? Uh, every story, I, every <laughs> every story I write, um, you know that that character becomes a part of me and. You know, when you're writing a novel, it it takes time. It it it's a it's a process to get through, and at that time can be you know you know six months or it can be a year or whatever it is. So you're spending a lot of time with these people that you're creating, and over that period of time, they become very real. I mean, you know, think about if you know think about a friend of yours that you spend you know time with um, for a year and and almost every day, 
you know, that's that's a rarity. That's that's a that's a spouse or a, or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or whatever, you know, and, um, you know, we don't even spend that much time with with, uh, you know, our, our best friends. So those characters, you know, begin to take on a life of their own and they become very real. Um, and, you know, there's there's a little bit of of carryover when I'm when I'm writing anything that takes place in Seattle. So, for instance, I'm working on a, a, a new book now. It'll be a standalone novel and it's about a, a young uh, lawyer, defense lawyer, a female defense lawyer who starts out in the PA's office and for various reasons ends up, you know, doing um, doing defense work. And, you know, so who who are going to be the detectives? Well, I'm not going to have Tracy be the detective and not going to have Faz and uh, and um, um, Gil, um, Del, excuse me, Castigliano. Uh, so I'm going to have, you know, but I'm going to I'm going to have, you know, two other detectives from violent crimes and who, who know those people. So, you know, all of that stuff begins to sort of work its way in into my writing but um the the characters are are very distinct for me robert did you grow up in in seattle or in in the washington state area no i grew up in in burlingame california um and i lived i lived there in the bay area up until um gosh i was probably 30 I was probably 36, 37 when we moved to Seattle. And, you know, we moved to Seattle because I wanted to take a shot at writing. I wanted to, um, I was a lawyer, I'd practiced law, and I was a partner in a law firm down there for 13 years. And um, I knew that, you know, they say the law is a jealous mistress, and it is. I mean, you're a partner in a law firm. That's, you know, that's that's not a job. That's a career. It's and it's it's full time and plus plus some. So, you know, I knew that if I was going to try to write, I was going to have to find a way out of the law, and um and that was moving. And my wife is from uh, Seattle. She's from um, uh, Bellevue. And, you know, she wanted to get home. We had a, a, a newborn at that time. And like, you know, a lot of women, she wanted to get home where she would have help. My family, yeah. I have older brothers and sisters. So, you know, having a new a new uh, child was not a was not a big deal on my side of the family. <laughs> but for her side of the family, it was a huge deal because uh, my son, Joe, was the first. So uh, she wanted to get back home to Seattle and and, uh, you know, I wanted to write. And so it was a good um, it, it was a good compromise for both of us. I'm I'm fascinated by um, how a sense of place uh, tends to to seep into your writing, um, and and how the the places where we grow up or places that have a a big influence on us um, tend to come out in in unique ways other than just the setting of books. Um, knowing that your wife has a connection to Seattle. Uh, is very interesting. Does does your personal connection to Seattle um, come out in the writing in any obscure ways or ways that that may not seem um, l- like on the surface, other than setting in in certain stories? Well, I you know every once in a while I'll I'll throw out one of those uh, one of those opinions, which uh, you know is a big <laughs> no no. Most most of those end up getting cut, um, but you know I try. I try to let my characters live in the setting that I create for them. And I try to put them in real settings. Uh, I don't try to make up uh, places or, or, or cities or things like that. So I, I, I put them in the, in those cities um, and, and I let them, I let them live there and, you know, they're going to have their own opinions. You know, Tracy's a police officer and um, you know, my couple of my more recent books, She's not real happy what's what's going on at SPD and what's going on with the city council and all those things. And, you know, that's just reality. Uh, but but I'm you know, I don't I don't venture into the politics of stuff too much because, you know, it's like it's like anything in life. Um, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Um, and, you know, yeah. they're there, you know, just go on Facebook and you can make the most innocuous statement. <laughs> <laughs> and people just, I mean, you know, they call them, I guess, the woke crowd. Uh, the woke crowd's just waiting, and they're just waiting yeah. to pounce. So I, I, I really try not to give them anything to pounce on because, you know, I unless it's and unless it's something that's really re- relative to the story, because you know, most of my readers they're just looking to be entertained. Yeah, when well, politics can be a, a a daily moving target these days, um, 
Yeah, <laughs> it could really be a minefield. Yeah, absolutely. It, it it really it really is, and um, and you know everybody's entitled to their opinion, but not everybody's willing to share that everybody's entitled to their opinion. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people out there that believe their opinion is the only opinion or is the right opinion. And, you know, I, I, that's, that's just not the, a battle that, that I want to go down in, in my, in my writing. Uh, my writing is, is meant to entertain readers. It's meant to, um, um, you know, take them away from reality, if you will. Um, so many of my readers e- have emailed me during the whole COVID crisis and have thanked me for not putting COVID in my books. Um, yeah. They just, they, they don't want to read it. They don't want to read about real life, you know, all the time. Um, they it's just, they want, they want to, you know, they want to escape. And, th- and that's what, that's what a good book and a good movie is. It's an escape. Um, last night, my wife and I were watching the the series um, Turning Point, which is about 9-11 and the Afghan war. And, you know, after about two or three episodes, I think there's only four, but after about two episodes, I was like, you know, can we turn this off? It's just too much. You know, yeah. it's just it's just too much. So I think my um, wife and I did the same thing, but it was uh, it was a couple of days before 9-11. We turned it on and I think we made it through one and three quarters, maybe through the second one. And and yeah, I'm, I'm like you as I, I lived through this once. I've I've, I've been here. I'm 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 good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I mean that's kind of that's kind of how I think a lot of people feel when they pick up a good book is they they want to be transported, they want to go someplace, you know. Absolutely. Well, speaking of that, um, you have had great success with the Tracy Crosswhite series, uh, also with the Sloan series, and and these are, um, very specific, uh, genre fiction, uh, books, and 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 fit in a in a in a specific, um you know, place on the bookshelf. And then you've also published um, with The Extraordinary Life of Sam Hill and now with The uh, the World Played Chess, these books are more literary fiction. And, you know, the, if you talk to writers, they say, you know, especially in today's market, you know, you've got to to have laser focus on and uh, with targeting your audience and your genre. And, you know, when you find a genre, you need to stick there and, um and and you you have kind of broken out of uh, some of that with with these two books specifically that we talked about and and the new book the world played chess specifically. Um, but can can you speak to that just a little bit about being a someone who's known as a genre fiction author and who does very well and that has a very um, substantial following. Um, but then also saying, you know what, I'm, I'm actually a three dimensional person and I want to tell other types of stories. And, uh, you know, wh- what is the landscape of publishing like now that that makes people so scared to to pursue all of the things that they're interested in? Well, I think it's just what you said. It's that, you know, um, they they can especially if you get a writer that's successful they know that they can sell books and and you know they can sell books with their eyes closed you know yeah. i remember when i was at um hachette which was a fabulous place and they they uh they um published john grisham and um maybe excuse me maybe it was david baldacci and um david baldacci has written a few more literary type novels and and i said to them what i'm one time you know does he do that? You know, are you doing that to sort of keep up with John Grisham and his, you know, his books like Painted House and Playing for Pizza? And uh, the the person I talked to said no. Uh, and you know, we it's difficult for us when uh, when a, a a writer of that caliber wants to do that because you know we know we can sell a million copies of his books, his legal thrillers. Uh, and and those other books that he writes, but um, these books, you know, are always kind of a crapshoot. So mm-hmm. you know, I think I think it's basically a uh, just a you know, it's a, it's a sort of a business decision. Um, but I also remember years ago talking to Lee Child when he you know wrote the Jack Reacher series, and I remember him saying at one point uh, that he was going to kill Reacher when when uh, he was finished because uh, he just wanted to to kind of move on. Um, and I think he, I don't know, he wrote 18 or 20 and, and, and now his, his brother is keeping the Reacher series going, which is, you know, obviously a, a huge success. Sure. So I just think that, you know, I think that, um, 
a lot of authors are their their publishers, you know, basically say to them, you know, we want a book a year and we want it to be the ones that we know we can sell and that are going to be successful. And basically those books sell themselves. Um, I had started out writing more literary type fiction, but I moved into into legal thrillers because when I got out of law school and I was kind of getting started, um, you know, that's when Grisham hit and Tarot and John Lascois and Phil Margolin. And, and so I, you know, I, I gravitated to the path of least resistance, if you will. Um, but that wasn't what I grew up reading. That's not what I grew up writing. And I know John Lascois wrote a, his first book was not a legal thriller. And I had already sort of started crafting out the extraordinary life of Sam Hell. But, you know, I went down the path of least resistance. But I also have a publisher that's just very open uh, to what I want to do because, um, you know, I've had success now. I've had success in legal thrillers. I've had success in police procedurals. Um, I've had success in literary novels. I've had suspense in, uh, success in espionage novels. And, you know, what I like to tell people is, you know, I, I just like to write stories. Right. Um, you know, and I think that's, I, I read that in Stephen King's book on writing is, is he's just, he just loves to tell stories. And sometimes those will morph into horror horror stories, and sometimes those will morph into more literary novels like The Shawshank Redemption and The Green Mile. Uh, you know, they they can take any number of forms. And um, you know, I am in no way, shape, or form comparing myself to Stephen King, but but I do love to tell stories the way that he does, and they're not all stories that are going to fit into a defined genre. Sure, authors. I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20 or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. What Death Taught Tarrant by Derek McFadden. Life is a journey. So is the afterlife. At the end of his life, Terrence McDonald must discover its meaning or he'll be banned from the afterlife forever and his soul will cease to exist. Join Terrence and those who love him on a poignant and unforgettable journey through a life at once wonderful and harrowing. Learn what Terrence learned. See what Terrence sees. By this provocative story's end, readers may even learn a thing or two about themselves. See why people are saying things like, Derek McFadden writes with an insight you can match. If you like the works of Mitch Album, I think you'll find What Death Taught Terrence a worthy addition to your library and the reading of it, a life-affirming journey. I found this story immediately immersive and it stuck with me long after I finished. What Death Taught Terrence by Derek McFadden, on sale now. Uh, 
when when you find yourself in um in a uh in a uh, a yearly schedule where um you, you know you you know I need to turn out this book this year and then that's going to lead to you know the next book next year and um and and you know it it's sort of it it sort of kind of becomes this self perpetuating thing um but then a story comes along and starts you know nagging at you like I'm like I'm assuming uh, happened. Uh, with the world played chess and you know sometimes stories just won't let you go and and you start thinking um this is a story i've got to tell and and i've got to work it into the calendar somewhere um what what was that process like for you when you started thinking about this book and it really um and and i'm 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 making assumptions here and please correct me if i'm wrong but was this one of those books one of these stories that just kind of wouldn't let you go and just needed to be told uh or you know why why was i guess what i'm asking why now what what was it about this story that wanted to be told now yeah you know i didn't i didn't write this book thinking about the 50th anniversary of the end of the vietnam war and i and i certainly didn't anticipate what was going to happen in afghanistan uh when and and i know my publisher didn't publish it with those things in mind um you know, and it wasn't necessarily a book that was begging to be written because during the COVID crisis, you know, the, my the only thing I could do was write. Uh, you know, you couldn't go anywhere, you couldn't you couldn't be anywhere, you couldn't travel. There were no book conferences, there were no, you know, uh, book sales presentations. I mean, you know, it was basically you were at your desk, and um, you know, for me that that was in a in a. I'll say this in a in, in in a way that is doesn't really take into consideration the tragedy of the COVID crisis. But for me, it was a little bit of a godsend because, you know, I could just I could just sit and write, which is what I do. And I think I figured out, you know, that I by by February of 2022, uh, in about a in about a 27 month period, I think I'm going to put out, you know, five novels and one Amazon short uh story um so that's fantastic yeah you know and you know there i know there will be people out there that say you know hey uh you know don't he, he you know he's putting out too much but again you know all i'm doing is is i'm just doing my job i i get up in the morning and i get to my desk and i and i sit down and i do my work and i i am a working writer this is what i do uh i'm not one of those people that writes for two hours and then I'm, I'm gone. I mean, you know, I, as I've gotten older, I, I've, I've been a little bit more free with my time and, and saying yes to doing other things, but, you know, predominantly this is, this is still my job. Um, and it's what I do. So, you know, um, yeah, it's, it's difficult because the schedule does get tight and, and, and I'll be, you know, I'll be in the middle of, of writing a story and suddenly I'll get the developmental edits in on a book or I'll get the copy edits in on another book and I'll have all three things going on at once. And it's real difficult to try to write a coherent story, at least first draft, when you're doing all these other things. But you know what? It's it's hard to do a lot of things in life. Um, you know, it's hard to be a lawyer, it's hard to be a doctor, it's hard, you know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, I'm not I'm not complaining because, you know, the the you know, my difficult tasks pale in in comparison to what some other people have to do. But, you know, The World Played Chess was really a book that I just started thinking about um, what, what, what I wanted to do after The Extraordinary Life of Sam Hell uh, with my publisher, Lake Union. And Danielle Marshall, my editor, had said to me, you know, that it's, it's probably going to be about a three year process. And, and she was exactly right. Um, and she said, I want I want to see another book from from you in, in about three years. And, you know, it was one of those things where I was I was just kind of thinking about what am I what am I going to write about? What am I going to write about? And, you know, there was there was nothing really that jumped out at me. Um, but I started finally, you know, as always happens, I started thinking of that summer of 1979 when I got a job working on a construction crew uh, after my senior year in high school and before I went off to college. Um, and I was working alongside two Vietnam vets. And, and one of those guys became became, uh, you know, somebody that I worked for, you know, for many years in summers and breaks and really helped me get through school. But, you know, the, 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 I, I started thinking about how that, how that summer was very transformative for me. And I think it's transformative for a lot of, 
um, men and women because it's that moment in life where you sort of have to say to yourself, oh, geez, I'm no longer a child. I'm no longer a kid. I'm not going to be coming home to my parents' house every night. I'm going to be in a dorm room or I'm going to be in an apartment. I'm going to be going to work every day, you know, or I'm going to be going off to war. And and so, you know, suddenly that that time period just became I thought about how transformative it was for for not only me, but now as a father, how transformative it was for my son and for my daughter and for my wife and I when they left the house. When, you know, when we took my son off to college, he went away to school and um, we were both in tears on the drive home. I mean, and you know, he was he was only, you know, six hours away by car, but we knew what that meant. He wasn't coming home every night after right. after school or after football practice. And it was it was it was emotionally wrenching. And then I started thinking about, wow, well, what about those young men that went off to war in Vietnam? I mean, what what must those parents have have gone through? So you know, I just began to sort of piece the story together. And the final piece really came from my son, Joe. And I had asked him to read an early draft of the novel because, you know, I had sort of pilfered some of our experience as father and son and his football years. And I didn't want him to feel in any way uncomfortable that I had that I had given away stuff in his about him in my book and hadn't talked to him about it. And he was the one who came to me and he said, you know, Dad, what happened to William, it sounds like was really terrible, you know, based upon how he deteriorated that summer. But I'd like to know what happened to him so that I can relate to it. I don't know anything about the Vietnam War. And that was the reason, Joe was the reason why I wrote the journal that has had such a profound impact on so many readers out there. Um, the initial reviews coming in are just off the charts. And it, it just, it was profound to them because, you know, people have asked me, you know, is this really sort of a, a, a guy's book? It's a men's coming of age book. And I said, no, because that's not fair to the mothers and the wives and, and right. the sisters who were all at home when 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 these guys went off to war and had to deal with it. And sure enough, so many of the reviews that I'm getting on Amazon are from, you know, people who lost spouses over there or, or who lost a brother over there, who lost the next door neighbor over there. And also, you know, Women go through their own transformative time, their own transformative period where they have to go through the same thing, which is they're not a child anymore. They're an adult and they have they have these societal norms they have to pay attention to. So um, long answer to your to your question. And Hank, and I apologize for that. But, you know, I think I think that's really it. It's it's a it's sort of a, one of the, a story of a that transformation, that shattering of illusions, which really applies to everybody. And. Like all good stories, I'm not sure exactly where it came from, but it was yeah. it once once I got the story, it was it, it it begged to be written. Well, and isn't that the great thing about the power of metaphor? Um, you know, I I'm going to be 50 this year, th so that means that that I was a kid. Uh, you know, when Vietnam was happening, a, a small kid. My dad um was uh actually served during that time. Um, and I didn't have that same experience, but because of his experience, um, like it, it means certain things in my life without me having to have gone through that. And um, in the same way that you say that this isn't just a, you know, a guy's book because it affected so many other people and the, the story may be about this thing, but it can mean so much more. Um, and and that's where the power of storytelling is that, you know, that, that we can derive our own meaning and, 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 you know, from something that we didn't necessarily go through or can personally connect to. Um, and, and have you heard those stories from, from, uh, people that, that were unexpected, uh, you know, that this book meant something to them, even though they personally might not be able to connect to it? Yeah, no, I, absolutely. I mean, that's like I said. I, you know, I've gotten, I've gotten some, some, you know, emails through my website, and then if you go on and you, you look at the reviews on Amazon. I mean, I think, I think we're already over 170 reviews. You know, uh, you know, when the book just came out, and the we're at 4.8. You know, which is, which is just, you know, it's almost five stars every review. Yeah, it's outstanding. It's outstanding. It's, it's fantastic. And yeah, a lot of those reviews there are from women and they will say, you know, I was, um, I lost my brother in Vietnam or 
you know, I, I did one somebody put in there that their twin went to Vietnam and they talk about how they didn't come back the same. They didn't come. They didn't come back, you know, the, the same person who left. And, you know, I think that that's true of of all of us when we leave home, whether we leave home to go work in the workplace or whether we leave home. Um, you know, I was amazed at, at how my son um, matured when he left home right. and, uh, you know, he just went off to college and that maturity, it, you know, it, it's in that comes from, you know, I, I, you have to make a doctor's appointment. You need to take care of it. You need to do this. You got to take care of it. You got to do your laundry. You got to go shopping. You know, your car breaks down, uh, you know, even and, and you know, even worse things than that, obviously, um, you know, suddenly you you ha- are responsible for you. And so when you do come home, um, you know, that's that's a, you're, there's a big difference there. You're you're no longer looking to mom or dad to, to correct everything or to, you know, to to uh, make everything right. Um, so um, it's a, it, I, I, I just think it's a it's a, a time in 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 life that everyone is going to be able to identify with in one form or another. The old adage is uh, you should never judge a book by its cover, um, which is total bunk because we all judge books by their covers. We um, do. And, <laughs> and the World Play Chess is so um, is a, has a stunning cover. Um, it uh, you know if you if you look at it for a moment, it's obviously a scene um, from the Vietnam War. Uh, you know the, the helicopters in the background, the soldiers. Uh, you know, in in the foreground and in shadow, uh, the palm trees behind it, and looks like napalm has probably just been dropped. Um, and then the the text, the world played chess um, right behind that is such a uh, such an interesting um, contrast. What what does the title mean, and and where did it come from? So the the title actually came from my buddy Dale. Uh, I went down to Palm Springs to um, to golf. And uh, he asked me what I was working on, and uh, I, you know, I was telling him it's oh, it's a story about a, a young man. Uh, he's now an adult. He's got an 18-year-old son, and he gets a journal in the mail from a, a guy he used to work with, you know, in when he was 18 years old on a construction crew, and the guy was a Vietnam vet, and it's the story of this guy's, you know, year-long journey in Vietnam and how it impacted this guy and how it's impacting his his fa- fathering of his son and. You know, I said it, it's loosely based on, you know, my life when, you know, I didn't even I, I grew up in this, you know, bucolic little town where, you know, kids did paper routes on their bicycles, you know, throwing them off the handlebars and all that. And I said, you know, I, I got here all suddenly I'm working with these two guys from Vietnam. I, I didn't even know what I was. I had no idea what what, what was going on. He said, oh, it's kind of like that that adage. The world played chess while I played checkers. <laughs> and I kind of shook my head and said, what? And he said, you haven't heard that? And I said, no. And he said, yeah, you know, it's a saying about how, you know, it, there's various iterations of it. Um, but it's it's basically, you know, about how sometimes we're, we're not even playing the same game that the rest of the world is playing. You know, they're playing a complex game that requires, you know, contemplation several moves ahead. And, you know, you're just trying to jump over a, a, a red checker in order to get k- crowned, you know. And I just thought it was, I thought it was brilliant. I thought it really summed up um, what the book was about because, you know, it's, it's, it's not a book about Vietnam as much as it's a book about um, coming of age and, and, you know, learning that, you know, you don't know everything. In fact, you, you know, you know, little, uh, and you, you know, you're not even, sometimes you're not even playing the same game. That's hilarious. Robert, there are scenes in the book that read like you had a front row seat um, to the action. Uh, what did you do to to connect with um, with this place that that you had never been in a conflict that you didn't serve, um, but yet you tell those stories so realistically? What what kind of what things did you use? to uh to get a connection to that so that you could convey that to us so well well thank you um i did a lot of research um and you know a lot of vietnam vets won't talk about their time in vietnam um and then of course you know it's those can be very personal 
stories and I, I didn't want to feel like I was stealing anyone's anyone's stories and and I wanted it to be you know a kind of a, a, a um, I wanted it to be a, 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 an experience that was unique to William and so you know I probably read 12 to 15 firsthand accounts of the time uh, these people spend in Vietnam who chose to wrote about write about it you know Tim O'Brien and Phil Caputo and you know a whole bunch of other books uh, that I that I read um, talking about their time in Vietnam. And some of those books were books that just had excerpts of, you know, you know, they, it looks, looked like they were almost interviews like Mark Baker's book, um, called Nam, you know, where they, there's just dozens and dozens of stories in there. Um, I watched all the, all the movies that you can name. I, I watched, um, I, wa I watched the documentaries. Um, and then I had, um, I had two, two people I knew, um, well, who had served in Vietnam uh, both in the Marines, and they were fairly high up uh, when they got out, and so they were able to provide me with, you know, the Marine manuals in Vietnam, and then they also offered to to read the manuscript and um, and correct it and make sure that I got it right, you know, where the Marines were stationed, what they were being asked to do, what they what they keep in their in their uh, bags, you know, what they don't keep in their bags, why they don't keep them in the bags, you know, why they don't they don't live in the bunks, they live in in the underground. Um, you know, when they're on fire bases, you know, all, all the all of the details that these young men had to learn because this was a war unlike any we had ever fought before. So I just I just did a tremendous amount of research and I kept doing research until the stories began to repeat themselves, because that's usually when I know, OK, it's, it's time to stop researching and it's time to start writing because, you know, authors can get stuck in the research mode. Uh, yeah. You know, you can research forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, and you know, you get almost intimidated to finally start writing. And um, you know, I I I have come to realize through my own experiences that when the stories start to repeat, and I start hearing and reading the same stories, um, then I know that I've I've probably completed my research. Um, and then you know, it's really a matter of becoming an 18 year old again, and um, remembering what it was like to have the comfort and warmth of your parents home and your brothers and sisters and your friends and everybody around you and then try to contrast that with suddenly you're in a foreign country with foreign climate foreign temperature and you are being asked to do something that you never never anticipated was going to be your fate um and how lonely and how scary and how anxiety provoking that must have been and so you know that's our job as writers is to become those characters um to become william and to to add a um to add a human element to the research that goes beyond the research and hopefully will touch readers hearts robert there are, there are probably readers out there that are day one robert dagoni um thriller buyers when when a new one of your thrillers drops they buy it because they know they they can trust you and they can trust your voice in that space what would you say to those readers who now see that you've written a book that's not a thriller uh, that that kind of lives in a different literary space um, what would you say to them um, to let them know um, that that this is a book that that you hope that they'll read you know what I would say is if you like my stories, I think you like them because you like the characters. You you fall in love with the characters, um, that the characters are, are three dimensional, whether I'm writing genre fiction or whether I'm writing, you know, more contemporary novels like The Extraordinary Life of Sam Hell. And so, you know, if if you love if you love stories about people and about what people go through. Um, that aren't necessarily plot driven, but are are character driven. That are there, it's it involves the human element. Um, then I think they're going to really like this book as much as they like any of the other stuff that I do. Um, you know, reading like anything is a personal uh, is a personal thing, and some people just love to be scared, you know, and and want to watch and read horrors. Uh, other people, you know, they don't want to do that. They want to they want to read more literary. Some people love to watch and read mysteries. My dad loved to watch mysteries because he loved to, to try to figure out if he knew who the killer was, you know, when he'd be watching a show. Um, that was kind of what he loved to do. So, um, 
you know, my hope is that the people out there that just love a good story will um, will give the world play chess a try. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned something a, a few minutes ago, Robert, that I wanted to ask you about. You you said that during this time that you have really been writing and, and uh, just, you know, finding the, the time and the space to to really churn out work and. Uh, you said that, you know, some people may be like, oh, he's he's writing too much and publishing too much. Um, I know that that you uh, over the last several years have have transitioned to publishing with uh, with with Amazon's um, uh, publishing houses, Thomas and Mercer for your thrillers and uh, Lake Union for for the new book. Um, and and Amazon through their publishing houses are, are really doing a, a lot of great things and, and bringing uh, some of the things we've learned from indie publishing and merging some of those things with traditional publishing and and hopefully uh, you know some of these attitudes are are changing. Um, is is that still a thing where where people are still in this, you know, no more than one book a year mindset and um, you know, we we really have to hold authors back and throttle their output because, you know, the market won't bear more than, you know, this. Is, is that still a, a a traditional mindset or do you do you see some of these things changing and attitudes growing um you know i can't i can't necessarily speak to all all authors or even all publishers um what i can say is that as an author you're only as good as your last novel and that's just that's just the reality of it um True. you know you might put out you know, 10 bestsellers in a row that people love. But when you put that clunker out there, they're going to let you know it. Uh, <laughs> this is a clunker. This is this is not up to his or her uh, abilities. And, you know, they just rushed it. They just put. So I think really the issue is not the frequency of publishing, but the quality of publishing. Um, if you can put out, you know, two books a year uh, that are quality books that that people enjoy, that they love, um, then I don't think that that's a problem at all. And, you know, I I will never put out a book that I wouldn't read. Um, I would never put out a book that I just don't feel comfortable with. I don't feel like it's up up to my standards because um, I don't ever want to put a reader in a position where they're reading something that, you know, they, they pick it up and they're really excited about it. And, you know, they start to read it and they realize it's, you know, it's, it's not, it's not, what they wanted to read. It's not at that quality. And then they, they feel sort of betrayed. So I think the real issue is, you know, and, and some authors work more slowly. I mean, some authors spend a lot of time putting together outlines and, and all those things. I'm an organic writer and, um, you know, I write the story as the character is telling it to me and I kind of take the, the logical step forwards and those kind of things. So um, I think it's really a matter of quality. Um, if you can put out quality, uh, I think you I don't think your publisher is going to have a problem with that. I mean, you know, you look at, again, you look at a guy like Stephen King. I mean, that guy is so prolific and, uh, and, and you know, are some novels better than other novels? Of course, but that's, that's just the way life is. Um, yeah. But every novel he puts out there, you know, it is it's there's quality in it, and I think that's I think that's the the pro, the the implicit promise you make with your reader is that if you pick up a Bob Dugoni book, you're going to get a, a quality story, and and that's that's all I think any author can strive to achieve. Absolutely, the new book, The World Played Chess, is available everywhere now. There's links to it in the show notes of this episode where you can grab it in Kindle edition or hardcover or audiobook, uh, whichever format you prefer, you can grab it today. Also visit your local bookstore. If your bookstore uh, is back open and in business, let's help keep them that way. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you if you want to order it, there's links where you can grab those. Uh, Bob, if people are, are just discovering you uh, or, or, or just digging into your work, where can they find you online? Uh, they can, my website is uh, www.robertdagonibooks.com. I'm on Amazon. If you go to um, Robert Dagoni slash books on Amazon, uh, you'll find me. And a lot of people like to read books in the order they're written. And both those locations will uh, will provide that to them and will explain, you know, a little bit about the different genres that I've written and, and uh, what order those books are in, like, for instance, the Charles Jenkins series. So. Um, I'm also on all the social medias, you know, I'm on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and, and all those places. So people can find me there also. 
excellent. We'll put links to all that great stuff in the show notes of this episode. Uh, Robert, thank you so much for taking time to come back on the show. Thanks for having me. It's, a, it's always a pleasure to speak to you, Hank. So, uh, yeah, anytime. I hope we can do this again. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Seven men ran the farce. The seven witch hunters. The court of Oyer and Terminer. They tortured and lied and mutilated and murdered. They knew those women up in Salem Village were no witches. Their true target was the coven hidden in their own midst here in Salem Town. They meant to hang the innocent until the sisters surrendered. Did they surrender? said Jason. No. Was that the wrong decision? To let innocent women die and save themselves? What do you think? Should the coven have fought openly? Created more hysteria by swooping in on broomsticks and casting spells over Salem? Should they have killed the judges? There are no right decisions. That is the horror of a witch hunt. Everything you do condemns you. Question the judge, thou art a defiant witch. Question his laws, you question the king, and thou art a treasonous witch. Question his superstitions, you question scripture, and thou art a blasphemous witch. Pity the condemned, you pity witches, and thy Christian mercy proves thy collusion with Satan. Witch hunters are not just bad lawyers practicing bad law. They are men who place the ends before the means. They choose their victim, a man, a woman, an entire race, and mark them for extinction. All evidence is damning evidence. All associations are damning associations. All infractions. And who among us is without sin? Are unforgivable infractions. Their own failings and abuses of power are shrugged away as mere vigor in pursuit of the public good. A witch hunter will have you by whatever means necessary. If he cannot find evidence, he will create evidence. He will entrap you and question you and distort what you say. He will walk you through the night until your feet bleed, strip you and stripe you, dress you in your own filth until you forget you are human. He will torture your friends until they betray you. And if anyone dares to weep at your hanging, he will drag them to Gallows Hill in the back of the next ox cart. Any man can be a witch hunter. All it takes is hatred and arrogance and the preening self-regard that proclaims my deeds are always good because they are my deeds. The seven judges of the Salem court were such men. But one witch stood up to them. She stood up to centuries of unchallenged murderous dogma and pronounced the magic word, no. They burned her for it. 